Hi everyone, welcome back. So this is part two on Nathaniel West and today we are going to talk about his final novel, The Day of the Locust. Uh, Nathaniel West died quite young at age 37 and so because of that we have only four books by him and this is the one that I think is the best. I think it's really interesting uh, what he's trying to do here, what he's trying to do in terms of style and theme and uh, he kind of wrote this knowing it would make a lot of people angry and he wrote it anyway um, and seems to have cared sometimes that his books were not critically acclaimed and were not as popular as things like Tender as the Night or This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald or The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. Um, but he's in these literary circles and uh, doing things sometimes to be part of the circle and doing things other times to piss people off, basically. So let's get into the book. Um <sighs> The, the plot overview I'm going to give you kind of from start to finish, and we're going to think of things in groups of chapters um, because I think that while I'm giving you the, the overall points of what is happening, in terms of style, how it happens is a little bit more important. So I don't mind as much with spoilers with in terms of uh, in terms of spoilers with this book. So chapters one through seven, we follow Todd, who has come to uh, Hollywood. He graduated from Yale University, and he is now in Hollywood to make it big, like everybody. But he's doing art. Um, interestingly enough, not a writer. You you might think that this is somebody inspired by Nathaniel West himself, but it's not. He grew up quite wealthy, as we learned before. Um, so Todd Hackett doesn't have too much money, um, but we find out that he's been in Hollywood for about three months. Like most people, he's come there from someplace else. And he's trying to um, prepare a painting that he sort of thinks about throughout the book here and there called The Burning of Los Angeles. It doesn't ever seem like, it doesn't seem to me at least that he is serious about like wanting to actually do this painting. Rather, what he finds himself doing is um, looking at all these people as he goes through life who have come to California to die. Um, or who have come to Hollywood to die. And so it's kind of like um, people who he describes as having eyes filled with their own hatred or their their eyes are filled with hatred, rather. Um, but he is working on set design. And one of the many people who is in the background that we don't see in these Hollywood movies that we, we often... Uh, leave even their names behind when we skip the credits, right? And I think this kind of speaks to, as I'm recording this, some recent events with a writer strike, which there have been a few uh, strikes in Hollywood. Um, many people think that everyone in Hollywood is is making tons of money and, the, and that, you know, everybody's a star. And the fact is really only a very small percentage um, get to that level where you recognize their name or recognize them if you see them on the street, right? Or be excited that you're meeting a movie star, that kind of thing. A lot more are like Todd in the background. And that is really who we see in this book. So we have Todd going to a party hosted by Claude Esty, who's a rather successful screenwriter. He seems to be kind of uh, middling to me. Um, let's say, you know, Nathaniel West said that he wrote C movies himself. Claude probably writes B's and maybe got one A in there. Um, but he's quite wealthy because of this. And he's having a party to kind of surprise his guests. We see them um, participating in some very odd behaviors, including going to a whorehouse to watch a pornographic movie. So again, starting off with 
the wealthiest people and the shiniest people that we're going to see um, in this book and seeing that even they are kind of participating in very seedy activities, right? We move then to focus in on Faye. Faye is the object of Todd's affection. Now, he's just graduated from school, so he's probably 22, 23, somewhere in there. Faye is 17 and lives with her elderly father, Harry. Um, Harry used to be a vaudeville star. So he talks about his life in vaudeville shows when he was a star. And you kind of get the impression that if Hollywood had not come along and if we hadn't had the talkies, um, the, the talking pictures and the moving pictures um, as, as movie is short for, if we hadn't had this, a lot of vaudeville stars would still be stars. And basically what happened is that movies killed vaudeville, these stage acts that were kind of put on throughout the country. You'd have traveling performers and that kind of thing. And Faye, Harry's daughter, probably would have been famous in her own right. But because the um, vaudeville is dying and pretty much kicked the bucket by this point, um, Harry and Faye are now in Los Angeles again, like everybody else, trying to make it big. And Faye wants to be an actress. And we're told that she was uh, mostly does background work, but she was in one movie where she said one line and said it badly. So she can't act, and she is really desperate to be an actress, and it's quite clear that she'd be willing to do kind of anything. She tells Todd that she can't uh, have any kind of affair with him because he's not wealthy and he can't help her career. He's got to have one or, or two or both. And instead, she begins to um, court or date in some manner this man named Homer Simpson, not who the cartoon character was named after, by the way. Uh, Matt Groening, who runs The Simpsons, says that all the characters are named after people in his family. So uh, nevertheless, we have a Homer Simpson in this book, and he is really this sad character who came to Hollywood because his doctor suggested it. He's not really wanting to make it big, but he's kind of um, gets into this relationship of sorts with Faye, and it's really not clear whether or not they've slept together. Um, so that's kind of interesting. He's also eventually got a couple of... Um, cowboys <laughs> cowboy actors uh, who have begun squatting at his house and he's kind of too afraid to kick them out um and the story takes a bent and sort of follows him for a little while then we come back kind of bring all of these characters together um todd Faye, homer harry um, and then we also have this man, Abe, who is a little person and sometimes, just so you're aware, is referred to in the book as the dwarf, which is meant to be demeaning even back then and is certainly a demeaning term uh, today. He may have dwarfism. He may just be a little person. We're not entirely sure, but that's how he's referred to. And he's kind of the first sort of bizarre character that we come across. So... We watch as Harry becomes sick. Todd is spending time partly to be with him, partly to kind of interact with Faye. Homer is kind of the same way. Eventually, he and Todd sort of become friends. Um, we have then uh, different scenes with them going. Faye goes on dates with a few different people, um, including a cowboy. And there's, there's sort of a fight that goes on. Um, and then... Later on, Harry dies. Um, when that happens, chapters 18 to 20 is showing us the, the funeral and the days after. Um, Faye, for a bit of time, goes to Miss Jennings' whorehouse, to, which we saw in the, in the earlier chapters. And it's implicated that she has become a prostitute at least for a period of time. Uh, her friend works there as well. And trying to think of how to get her to not do this anymore, Todd kind of shakes her and, and treats her roughly. 
Um, she ends up in a relationship with Homer and very quickly that sours and she starts kind of making fun of him in public and, and things like that. In chapters 21 through 27, so now we're in sort of the, the last third of the book, Homer and Faye are living together. But in this very bizarre like business arrangement um, where he's paying for everything like headshots and clothing and things like this so she can become an actress. And it, again, not clear whether she's sleeping with him. It seems not. Um, and Todd is still obsessed with her. Um, and then the two of them break up. Todd and Homer go to a uh, cockfight where there are roosters. And um, then at the end, we have a mob scene, basically, where um, angry people come out and they're gathering in a mob and then uh, Homer is pulled under by the crowd. Todd is kind of taken away by a policeman or saved by a policeman. And at the end, he is sort of imitating the siren of this, this like forlorn wailing. Now, if my description of the plot seems disjointed, that's because it is. It's not that I'm intentionally leaving everything out. There are a number of other scenes in there. At one point, Todd forces a kiss onto Faye. At other points, he um, is imagining that he is uh, violating her sexually or sexually assaulting her, if you want to put it that way. Um, he's never even able to fully imagine this, but he's supposed to be almost like as much of a hero as we get in this book, he's supposed to be a, a sort of good guy. And to me, he's a very typical, stereotypical good guy in that. Um, he's shouting about how good of a guy he is while having these fantasies of assaulting her and trying to force a relationship onto her that she does not want. And she's clearly said, you know, we, we aren't really even friends, but in terms of sort of friend zoning him, that's basically what she's done. Um, but stylistically, the book is a little bit disjointed and we don't have exactly, um, and I mentioned this, I think, with Hemingway's stories, we don't have exactly this traditional plot arc of like exposition, rising action, climax, conclusion or resolution um, because it is left open. But even in that, um, the part about Homer seems like kind of a departure, especially when we switch suddenly from following Todd to following Homer. And um, we also have some flashbacks where it's not entirely made clear that they're flashbacks. This this use of his. the So we'll, we'll talk first here about about point of view. There is a third person omniscient point of view so it's not a character telling the story it's a narrator who knows everything that's going on and everyone's thoughts and things like that it's it's somewhat limited in that it pretty much follows todd and then follows homer for a bit and then follows todd again particularly todd's interactions with uh the other characters and um, I think that that's an interesting choice. I think that it lends a little bit of distance so that we aren't exactly intimate with just one person, um, that we can see the larger picture. So that is kind of an interesting choice. Some other stylistic things you might notice, very short chapters, so it does seem to move along at quite a fast pace. Um, West is using quite a bit of uh, slang of the time. Um, Faye at one point is forcibly kissed and she she kind of tries to laugh it off and says, oh, mama spank. I, I don't know exactly what that's supposed to mean, but I think she's supposed to be saying like, no, no, no. Uh, that was a naughty thing to do because likely uh, she wants to say more, but she's trying to kind of be polite about it and kind of be humorous. 
So it's those kind of little things, like, I don't, 23 skidoo and things like that that they might have said in the 30s. It's the, that part is very of the time, right? The other thing I want to say about the style of this book is that just to kind of again go through for people who are not in my class or even if you are and you forgot. So in the 1800s, we have romanticism, which is looking at things like faraway plots and distant places and improbable events and um, things where the, the the weather takes on strong emotion and and so do you know we have the sweeping moors of England and uh, things things like that Nathaniel Hawthorne's scarlet letter is taking place in the in the past and we're examining that and the feelings of the time right then after that after the Civil War, in the United States, in terms of literature, we have a really huge shift where writers don't want to write about things that are improbable and happened long ago and, and could never occur and all of that. They really want to focus in on realism and regionalism. So looking at the different regions, and we also have a movement called Local Color, um, looking at the different regions of the United States and how are they unique and different and how can we kind of come back together as a nation while appreciating all of these differences, right? So we have, for instance, there, uh, Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer, where it's quite nostalgic looking back on the past with fondness, but it's also there are a few things because it's an adventure book for boys that are a little bit more improbable toward the end. They're, they're chased by the villain through a ca cave, but there are other things that are quite realistic that would have happened. Um, being forced to take painkiller by your, by your aunt because you're, you're supposedly sick, skipping school, having to paint a fence as a chore, right? All of those kind of things. And certainly some of the other short stories of the time period are even more realistic in terms of their details. So what happens in the modern era, um, this point after, um, after that, from the 1910s until the 1940s, so kind of the period uh, from World War I until World War II. And that's what we've been looking at with these lost generation writers. What happens there are kind of a couple different movements within the last generation, a couple different things that people are trying to do. One of them is to continue this idea of realism, but have a little bit of a different take on it where the modern realists, yes, there are things that could happen um, and are very realistic in that sense. We have verisimilitude, which is, uh, I think of as like very similar to, um, writing things in a way that is very similar to how things looked or felt at the time, right? Um, and things that that could happen. And certainly we see or have seen uh, New York City, Paris, uh, sometimes Italy, right? All of those locations. Um, but having a much more cynical view. So gone is the nostalgia. And instead of trying to depict things exactly, we have more subjectivity put into it. So these are still realistic plots. They're still trying to show the the people of the time of the, the different areas in which they're living um, here with Los Angeles. But they're infusing some subjectivity into it. They're very interested in psychology and all of that kind of thing, right? So what Hawthorne does, though, is he has a little bit of a, a further departure from this. So when we read the stories by Hemingway, we see things like a man and a woman talking about whether or not to keep a baby or a prize fighter who is uh, maybe going to be killed um, for something that happened possibly with with some gangsters in Chicago. Um, those kind of those kind of scenes are um, in Nathaniel West's work, similar themes, similar um, ideas, but done in, in, in my opinion, a very different way. And this has been called imp expressionistic. Um, so instead of 
really trying to have things. Here's the scene um, in Hollywood exactly as it would be between a, a man and a, a starlet, a, a woman who wants to be a movie star. Instead of that, we get a lot of... Um, and almost uh this is this is difficult to explain so it, to me it's it's like that that painting the scream by edward monk where you can uh actually it's a reaction to somebody else screaming the person's covering their ears but it it is quite a bit like that so a lot of uh symbolism um descriptive details and almost like a painting it's more about the feeling of the moment so inspiration expressionism in literature um, kind of came up as a reaction against materialism so this idea that the the bourgeois uh <laughs> the middle class is kind of complacent there's urbanization there's um everything is being mechanized right it's it's all mechanical um and so we have these i'm looking at my notes sorry we have writers trying to convey these ideas through this new style so it's kind of like sketches in this book as we explore the nihilism that we've seen in a lot of the lost generation uh, writers but um i think in west's instance in particular it comes through in a more artistic way so here's the deal you're either gonna love that or you're gonna hate it um i find that when i when i've taught this book in the past people really uh respond to this book and they they kind of feel along with the characters this idea that everything and pardon my language but that everything in Hollywood is kind of bullshit and that it's nonsense and that it doesn't mean anything and that these people are chasing crap for no reason um, that they've lost their morals they've lost their center they just want fame and money and power and sometimes all three right that is basically what he's trying to convey with this style so because of that it's it's not a cohesive narrative because it isn't meant to be it's meant to have you uh have an, a gut emotional reaction more so than following each plot point of the story it's it's like little things that are happening here and there to kind of bring together this vision of Hollywood at that time. Um, and some people really respond to that. Some people are like, what the hell is going on in this book? Um, so that's one of the reasons that I wanted to go over the plot points with you, because I think sometimes they get lost in the, uh, the style of this. In particular, there's a wonderful scene in which Todd is chasing Faye and it's all the back lots. So it's it's the Hollywood has this front where you can see things and they have a lot where they shoot a number of different shows, movies, etc. Sometimes all at once. And he's running through um, fake Waterloo, uh, a city that's on fire, a uh, jungle and all of these kind of things trying to find Faye. And... As much as Todd seems to hate the fact that all of these people in Los Angeles are chasing these materialistic things, he's chasing Faye as his elusive dream. So he doesn't necessarily want fame or riches, but he does want uh, this girl and much less about love and much more about lust and just sexual desire than actually caring about her because she's kind of an idiot. Um, so, <laughs> so, um, characterization real quick. Todd is our, uh, protagonist, our main character for most of this book, not necessarily a hero, um, kind of a nice guy, 
sort of, in my opinion, not. I think you might get a different reaction if, if, a, if a male teacher was teaching this book. Um, but really dragged along by uh, fate to kind of be in this place at this time and, and really not seeming to know what to do with his life or what he actually wants out of life. Then we have Faye, the 17-year-old kind of... Um, a little bit of an airhead, but she's quite shallow. She has some ideas for movies that she thinks maybe Todd could write up, but for the most part, she's willing to use her body to get the fame that she wants. So she's more than understanding of the fact that she um, may have to sleep with somebody to further her career. And when we look at the Me Too movement, a lot of people have uh, come forward in Hollywood saying that they were, you know, pressured into doing that. But Faye kind of, um, she's putting herself in a position to do that, basically. I'll put it that way. Homer is quite bumbling and uh, taken in by the wiles of Faye. He really has no power whatsoever. Abe is a sort of very crass uh, man who seems might have come from the carnivals. So they're coming from the carnivals. They're coming from the from vaudeville. They're coming from uh, places for the weather for um, uh, for better opportunities. Claude is a the successful screenwriter and and kind of again very very shallow the so-called friendship that he has with Todd and then Harry is the vaudevillian and so we don't have a lot of character depth other than the fact that these people are sort of types that you would find and the seedy kind of underbelly people that Nathaniel West encountered while he was running motels and things for his family prostitutes and petty criminals and um people just aging stars and and ingenue starlets who were never going to get anywhere that's basically who we're finding throughout this book colorful characters now some people have read these colorful characters as quite funny and satirical in a in a funny way rather than um, I think the way that West intended to be more of a dark satire, which is holding things up for for ridicule and certainly trying to show the values of the people in Hollywood. At this point in time, Hollywood in the 1930s, we have uh, kind of an explosion of of wealth going on in Hollywood while the rest of the country suffered. Um glitz and glamour and things that people wanted a lot of the movies from this time period are all about fantasy in 1939 the book that that the year that this book was written we have gone with the wind coming out we have the wizard of oz coming out um we have movies as i mentioned people like fred astaire and ginger rogers dancing through high-rise apartments that um are are enormous and and Shirley Temple being like the orphan who does good and and finds wealth and happiness and all of that. So really the studios are making money and people can go at this time to the movies for about a nickel. So a lot of times you could have a double feature and you could go and forget about your problems for, you know, 3 or 4 hours. Sometimes they would show newsreels before and in between the films as well. And um so the themes kind of tie into that because West is trying to show how fake this is and how phony we're going to see over and over again throughout this book. Look for words like mask, pantomime, play acting, putting on a show. Um, Faye's father, Harry, passes away and she starts going into this tantrum. Oh, it's my fault. I killed him. I know I killed him. And uh, Todd says to a friend watching, just forget it. She's acting now. She's acting again. Um, because this is this kind of histrionics. He talks about Harry's face before his death seeming like a mask with these beads of sweat that were about drying up on a desert. Um, taking off the mask, 
putting on a show, pretending over and over again, the idea of fakeness, the idea of illusions, um, that is the major theme going throughout this book. And one of the reasons that I really love it, because I do think that even today, that is what is going on. We have this man who, Todd, who is seeing the set design. And when he runs through the sets looking for Faye, he's looking at plastic flowers and fake swans and um, men who are in armor made out of cardboard and all of that kind of thing just to show the falseness of everything that is going on around him. At the same time, we have dreamers and schemers who are trying to work their way up in this world and they're trying to get clout and get parts and roles and um, and it's all for nothing. It's all for nothing. So the themes of the, the loss of the moral code, the disillusionment, complete emotional disconnect. None of these none of these characters are emotionally connected to each other in any way, shape or form. Um, and then we have quite a bit of sex in this book, particularly for the time period. Um, Homer catches Faye in bed with someone Um Todd is always dreaming about sleeping with Faye. Faye is a prostitute for a time. There's a dirty movie involved, right? And at this point, Hollywood was under the Hayes Code, which said that they could not have certain material in their movies. And yet, in the background, they're in the front, they're they're having all this family-friendly kind of fun musicals, that kind of thing. And in the background, there's all of this sex and violence going on, right? And that is what he's trying to show in this book. So sexuality, sexual violence, who has power and who is using their sexuality to get power um, and to get money, to get wealth, all of that kind of thing. Um emotions are not as involved and and men in particular i think are um portrayed as impotent and i don't mean that exactly like in the bedroom but um as not having power as being removed from power um and i do think because of all of those things this makes a great companion reading for uh, works by Ernest Hemingway that are kind of asking some of these same questions. What do we do when we lose our moral code? What is the role of the man? What does masculinity mean in this modern era, right? All of those kind of things are questions I think that Hemingway brings up and tries to answer that we're also going to find here with West. So to recap, um, look for kind of shallow characterization, uh, a style that focuses on uh, expressionism more than exact realistic plot development. Um, it's much more about the feeling of each scene and, and how the, the main characters feel and how we feel watching it, which is like kind of gross and icky. Um, Hollywood in the 1930s and what is being presented to the public versus what's going on in the background with like cockfights and, and, and silly people who do have money putting things like fake plastic horses at the bottom of their pools to like get a laugh out of people because they think it's kind of funny to be grotesque, right? Um, the people who are not making it big, people like Abe and Harry and Faye, uh, Harry in particular keeps looking back nostalgically talking about the good old days, um, but there really were no good old days, right? And uh, so this style is, is uh, something I want you to look for and how that fits into the, the stuff about the lost generation that we've been talking about. And then the themes, primarily the idea of acting and falseness that is going on all around, um, but also what it means to have a dream in Hollywood and how um, you have to kind of sell your soul to get there. And once you do, what does it mean when you lose your moral code? And how does all of that come together at the final scene to have this conflagration, this fire of Los Angeles is burning and people are being swept away by this mob? Um, why is what I want you to kind of think about. How is the the idea of 
the falseness and the, the sexuality that's running through this book and the loss of moral code, how does that all kind of connect back together to be violent? And why are all these people angry? And why are they coming to California to die? Um, not the most happy book, but I think an interesting one and one that uh, still carries quite a bit of weight today. I kind of would like you to think about that, too. How does it... Um, seem, you know, we have reality shows that aren't real and we have uh, child stars being mistreated and exploited. We have people um, kind of still selling themselves out for this kind of this kind of dream and chasing something that maybe isn't real. So all of that uh, is in this book and I can't wait to see your thoughts on it. Thanks, everybody.